Where do old aeroplanes go when the time comes to retire them from the sky? Almost one in ten of them are flown to eCube Solutions in Wales, one of the world's fastest growing facilities for the recycling and stripping out of old aircraft. Whatever the customer wants, we'll take off. Every year, around 60 commercial airliners land at the company's designated airbase, and the lads just can't wait to get their hands on them. All these planes, and you just get to play with the biggest toy set in the world. This squadron of high-vis heroes love to get their hands dirty and fly in the face of whatever problems are thrown at them. Yeah, there's pressure. Um, we cope with it, we thrive on it. They join forces to take these old airliners to pieces so their thousands of mechanical components can be sold on to satisfy the growing global demand for refurbished plane parts. Let's get them off the aircraft. But it's a race against the clock to take these multi-million pound planes to pieces before they reach their final destination, the scrapyard. All these are ready to go now, so we're going to have the demolition boys are going to be coming in and they're going to start smashing them up. Join the lads as they battle hostile weather and get to grips with massive machinery. I've seen them go down smoother, put it that way. All to meet deadlines set by bullish buyers. Money's time, time's money. And we're not talking peanuts here, we're talking millions. Welcome to the world of the plane reclaimers. So, good job, Ed. Yeah. <laughs> Base here at St. Athens is set to feel a whole lot smaller today as the lads are set to witness the entrance of some seriously heavy metal. There's a 747 coming in today and uh, they really are a, a massive aircraft, so getting it out onto the yard is going to be a, a bit of a challenge to say the least and it's going to be quite a, a mission to chop it up, but the, uh, the lads are up for a challenge. This colossus of the sky is just a few miles away now, landing from her final flight, 150 miles from Heathrow Airport to its final resting place here in Cardiff. After today, she won't be taken to the skies again. This isn't because she doesn't have the potential of further years of loyal service in her. It's because her owner believes she's more commercially viable as a parts plane, as they can have all of her valuable components stripped out and sold on. Our top team are used to taking delivery of all sorts of small and medium-sized aircraft, but a plane as big as a jumbo is an altogether different beast. Expectation is now growing for her imminent arrival, and Sam and Bob are heading out to meet and greet it and tow its sizable frame back towards base. Going to pick up an aircraft, a 747, from the end of the runway. Because they're so big, they can't turn round. So we'll push him back and then bring him down off the taxiway. Request permission to enter Echo at Echo 3 and then hold at Echo 2. We just wait then until the tower contact us again, tell us that the engines are shut, and then we can go down to the, uh, the front of the aircraft then. With its iconic hump, the 747 is one of the most recognisable aircraft in the world. So you would have thought Sam and Bob would have no trouble spotting it. Well, I can't see anything on the horizon out there, so... It seems, though, that in all their excitement, the lads have turned up a touch too early to meet and then move the inbound 747-400, which gives Sam enough time to indulge himself in a little private pleasure. Just trying to see if we can find the aircraft on the flight finder. It's not coming up on the search. This is an aerosexual. Aerosexual. Yeah. Ain't that bad, Bob? An aerosexual is somebody who's got a very keen interest in aviation. Um, you could say plane spotters. Yeah, I feel we may have a few um, plane spotters within E-Cube. We've seen them with flight radars on their phones, so um, we, we do have some closet ones, yes, definitely. You get some people that stand on the end of runways all day, every day, just to spot aircraft. Not quite that bad. I think the only person that Sam is convincing is himself. There it is. The first glimpse of it. <laughs> just coming over Yates, just outside Bristol, yeah? They're about 10 minutes away now, I think. It's easy to understand why the 747 has so many admirers. The thing with the jumbo is it's just so big. And trying to find things on it, you know, you get a picture out of the, out of the manuals, 
and you think you've got the right area and it's probably 10, 15 foot the other way, but the, the picture looks like you're in the right place. At last, it seems the wait is finally over. A small dot on the horizon reveals that this big bird is making its final approach. Just see the silhouette of it now. Looks like it's just hanging there, doesn't it? And actually look like it's moving. Something that big. We're going that slow. Yeah, this is a fuselage is so big, isn't it? Touchdown. The Jumbo has performed a flawless and graceful landing. It sure is big. So big, in fact, that its upper deck alone has the same square footage as a Boeing 737. Go in it. It's just the size of it. And then you, you, you go along the cabin, and then you've got, oh, we've got another, got another story upstairs. After manoeuvring the plane into position, Sam and Bob can now lock in the landing gear and turn their attention to the crew. We'll do what we can at the moment. We've got to get the crew off. Perfect. We've just uh, put the safety pins in the legs and the undercarriage to make them safe, if you can find it. <laughs> There's a pin. That stops the undercarriage from collapsing. This one we're not working on very often. It's just trying to remember where the holes are, where the pins go, especially on that nose one. I've completely forgot. The crew will now disembark the 747-400 for the final time. It's always sad to say a last goodbye. But before the takeout and teardown boys get to work, this jumbo is to get a short reprieve. We're going to leave it here for the moment because we've got a few other aircraft to move around. But before going home tonight, we'll put it in a position where we can start taking engines off tomorrow morning. The lads will need all the shut eye they can get. After all, stripping and scrapping something on this scale is sure to be a truly epic encounter. Whilst the strip out starts on the recently landed jumbo, over on another parked up 747, Captain Chris Hammond, a pilot who once flew her, is having a nostalgic look around. In 43 years as a commercial pilot, Chris clocked up more than 24,000 flying hours in total. And the Boeing 747 was a plane he grew very fond of. Very familiar. Very familiar. Wonder if I could do it still. First thing you always do is fit the aeroplane around you, move the seat up and down and sideways, and, and see how the, the yoke feels in your hand. Tiny movements control this aeroplane, an inch or so, so it's got to be in exactly the same place for your hand every time. The last time I sat here, I was wearing these. I was on the 13th of September. Uh, 2003, this aeroplane coming back from Singapore. A long flight through the night. As a young boy, Chris knew he wanted to fly. And after applying for a pilot training scheme, he was able to fulfill his dream at the tender age of 20. I started with BIAC. So I came to long haul flying, which is why I wound up flying this aeroplane. It's a lovely aeroplane to fly, flying. Somebody once described it as a 480 knot pub crawl around the world, which is a slight exaggeration. <laughs> it's very hard work, honestly, but the sort of people that do it are the people that enjoy visiting places, that they enjoy travel. And travel he did. Throughout his career, Chris managed to fly to 98 countries, the vast majority of those when piloting a 747. As a new day dawns, the team are gearing up for the Herculean tasks that lay ahead. And to take on a strip out of such colossal proportions, Sam has got himself organised. It's come up to the uh, flight deck now. We're going to start taking all the, uh, all the instruments out, the uh, screens and all the rest of the instruments out of the flight deck. And that's it. That's today's job. This toolbox has been a mess for the last... Oh, well, since I think before Christmas, so... He actually got his first tidy out for, this, for the year. In total, there are 365 switches, dials and lights in the Jumbo's confusing-looking cockpit. 
and many of them have the potential to be recycled and used in other aircraft. Fortunately for Sam, the plane's new owner has demanded just a few of the more valuable components. The main value bits are the, uh, the main screens, the six screens at the front here, but then everything to do with avionics type stuff in a, an aircraft is, is pricey. Got a list of uh, just over 600 items for the whole aircraft. I think by the end of the day, we should have 150 logged in. And that's mainly with what comes out of the flight deck now. There's no saying that that is purely for 747. That might fit a 737 or a, a 777 or 767. Compared with a 737 or an Airbus, the parts count coming out of the flight deck on this, on the 74, is pretty much the same. They're old, old fashioned floppy disks. Little, uh, it shows how old the technology on these are. It's the disc player. It may look like a relic from the past, but this aircraft was still in service ferrying holidaymakers around the world just weeks ago. It's just a shame about the retro paint job. It's the colour of it that makes it look dated, isn't it? Horrible brown. I just imagine the people who designed this had avocado bathroom suites, didn't they? <laughs> the designers may have had lousy taste in the style stakes, but they certainly did devise an aeroplane that was loved by the pilots who flew her, pilots like Chris Hammond. It's a lovely aeroplane to fly. It looks after you. The systems have been designed by real pilots. The flight management systems, the screens, they mean something to a pilot almost instinctively. They knew which bits that pilots worry about with the flight, uh, and they did their best to eradicate them. Still needs running, but it, you feel it's helping you rather than fighting against you. So just how daunting does it feel launching over 400 tonnes of jumbo jet down a runway and piloting her up into the sky? Lined up at the end of the runway. You do that as you stand the power up a bit, almost vertical, and you watch the engines spool up. Once they're stable, all four are responding. Then you press those two buttons there, either one of them. They're called the toga buttons, take off, go around buttons. And from what you've programmed into the computer, it will apply the correct amount of power to take off. And you press the button. And after that, you just follow it. It does everything by itself then. They go like that. You're not actually pushing anything. You're just holding onto them in case you have to pull them back a bit quickly because if something that you're not expecting happens. If it's a very heavy takeoff, lots of fuel, lots of people, it's a slow acceleration. But if it's a light takeoff, you feel the kick of power you get down the back. And you're off. And that's when you stop thinking, when you start concentrating on keeping the thing straight on the center line of the runway. And you start flying it at about 60 knots, which is about 75 miles an hour. It's an aeroplane then. It stops being a ground machine, even though it's still on the ground. And you start treating it like a flying machine, keeping the wings level, you then take your hands off that because you ain't going to touch them, you ain't going to close them, you mustn't close them. Keep the airplane straight again using the rudder and you've got to take it in the air. If the engine blows up at that point, you train for it. It handled like a fighter and yet it's 400 tons doing 85% of the speed of sound. And it sounds wrong, but it, it was actually very good in the air. It's a pilot's airplane. I don't know anybody that doesn't like it. I miss it in lots of ways. The sheer volume of aircraft on site is keeping Sam and the gang very busy. We have to juggle aircraft around because we have a flow going into the hangar. So we, we can have, say, a 747 outside having engines worked on it, but a couple of aircraft behind it that need to go into the hangar the next week. So we're constantly, at the moment, shuffling aircraft around to maintain our um, maintenance flow. More aircraft to salvage may be great for business, but with the airbase reaching its full capacity, moving a Boeing 747 through all the danger will test Sam's driving skills to the limit. So we haven't had this many aircraft here before, like, you know. And we've got one coming in, I think, 11, so uh, we've got to be clear for that ourselves. I've only been towing the aircraft for a couple of years now, and then I've just sort of basically taught myself. It's all pretty simple. I still don't think I could reverse a caravan on the back of my car or anything, but uh, <laughs> I don't intend to ever, but there we go. It's time for Sam to move today's main contender. So 
bringing the 747 up. And if manoeuvring the planes wasn't enough to worry about, further down the yard, the lads are testing engines on full power, known in the trade as a max power run. Sam and his gang need to make sure they don't get too close to any engines being tested, or well, there could be a fatal disaster. Every single time you do an MPA run, you have to contact the tower and notify them that you're doing a max output run. For any owner or potential buyer, a maximum output run is a critical test that's carried out to establish the condition and ultimately the value of an aircraft's engines. Let's say you're doing a max output run and a truck or worker passes by towards the back of the airplane, it could get blasted away. It's crazy the amount of output that comes out of those engines when they're from idle all the way to max output. The distance between the tightly packed planes is minimal. For Sam to safely steer through trouble, he needs his support crew to stay alert and keep their eyes peeled. Well, I'm seeing, I can't see it. But you've also got the back end sticking out. I can't see it from there. So I'm totally relying on these boys, you know, so uh, they're my eyes out there. But even having helpers still leaves a huge room for error, especially when handling something as vast as a jumbo jet. It can be a challenge, but you've got to have trust in uh, your wingmen. Just keep watching everybody and watch everything that's around you. At least you've got people assisting you there. When you're parking your car, you're on your own, aren't you? And if you get it wrong, there's always somebody going to walk past and laugh at you. <laughs> if they don't give me the right information, then I end up hitting something. But it's their fault in the end. They're out there, they're looking. But what they don't realise, they're like now, Dan, he's right behind the nose deck, I can't see him. It's like a lorry driver in his mirrors, isn't it? The push bikes. Uh, if you can't even see his mirrors, he can't see you. After a tense final manoeuvre, Sam's made it. The jumbo is out of harm's way, for now. All in all, it would have to be done at some point. And I suppose at least today we've got sunshine rather than chucking it down with rain. Look, it matters in it, because I've got a roof. <laughs> Which is a novelty. If one thing is for certain in this glorious Welsh weather, work on the airbase is set to really heat up. The next morning bathes the airbase in glorious sunshine. And whilst for our high-vis heroes it's business as usual, the arrival of the 747 has brought a brigade of special visitors out in force. I'm Ian Saunders, watch manager Ian Saunders, uh, and we are here today to carry out a joint training exercise with South Wales Fire Rescue Service. For just a few hours today, the semi-stripped-out remains of the 747 will become a makeshift training ground. It's clear to see why they don't normally get to practice firefighting on an operational jumbo jet, as the brand-new 747 commands a price tag of around $150 million. Understandably, people don't want us to go in and use their aircraft spraying foam outside, using media inside, causing possible damage with the hoses. Here we have that opportunity to go in, still safely, without any excess damage, but you're using the real airframe, not a simulated airframe. It doesn't really get much better. There may be nothing better than the real thing, but when it comes to saving injured passengers from a smouldering 747, thankfully, in the name of health and safety, they're using dummies today which have been surreptitiously scattered around the cabin work your way down that aisle all the way to um, the stairs we've had the opportunity to get on uh, a jumbo jet which is real nice we've had to uh, simulate basically the, the jets actually crashed heavens forbid you have actually come across the day that something like this may happen with Cardiff Airport in close vicinity, the local rescue service knows that a serious accident like this could be a scenario they may one day have to face. Well, the back, one casualty located, and we're bringing them down and out now, okay? We're looking for, I think it was in the region of eight or nine unaccounted bodies today, and it's something we're not really all that used to, so to get the training opportunity really is uh, invaluable. Oh, 
The plane's actually due to be dismantled. It's in a fair mess, which obviously simulates pretty well that it's actually been involved in a crash. So it's making searching a lot harder. <laughs> They've used smoke machines today to actually fill the cabin with smoke as well, so the visibility is really low. And obviously, we carry hose with us because there was a fire involved at one stage, and then actually relieving the casualty from the, from the danger area as well. One of our managers has kindly hidden the largest casualty that we actually carry right at the back of the, uh, of the aeroplane, which is tight enough for them to get up to, let alone us with our BA sets on. Obviously, with your mask, your visibility is slightly impaired. It's tough enough at the best of time. When you're trying to squeeze yourself into those sort of tight spaces and then bring a 75 kilo dummy down with you, then it makes that a little bit harder. The exercise today has been carried out in warm weather. It does make things very, very difficult. You wouldn't have thought anyone in Wales would complain about a bit of warm weather. But today's scorching sun certainly doesn't make wearing heat resistant clothing any easier. This is designed to keep heat out, I think. Uh, up to the region of 400 degrees maybe, but it also retains a fair amount of that heat, especially on a sunny day in Wales. You put this gear on and it doesn't take long before you're getting pretty warm. Let's just hope the day never comes when those fire crews will sweat in earnest. But if it does, it's reassuring to know they will be well prepared. All casualties recovered and uh, safely recovering in hospital, you'd be glad to know. The take-out and tear-down boys have been hard at it, stripping out more than 600 valuable parts from the 747-400. From components as big as the engines, worth as much as $8 million each, to items as small as the temperature sensor, worth just a few hundred dollars. But with so little demand for the jumbo anymore, many of these parts will now just sit on the shelf. As Mike Korn, E-Cube's commercial director, explains. 747-400. When it came to market, it was 1988, so it's over 30 years ago since the first aircraft entered service. Um, and they haven't been built for about 10 years. Um, when they came to market, they were the biggest, most expensive aircraft that, that money could buy. You know, they, uh, if my memory's right, even back then they were worth about $150 million. Um, the remarkable thing is, here we are 30 years later, more than half of them are no longer in operation. They have all been decommissioned. And consequently, the demand for their spare parts is actually rather low. You compare it to one of the little 737 new gens that we see here, an A320, and they're actually worth a fraction. And it's purely due to supply and demand of uh, too little uh, appetite in the market for the inventory and too much inventory available to be sold. Now all that remains is not much more than one colossal scrap job. So the wrecking crew have gathered with technical leader Nick to discuss how to shift the jumbo's colossal frame closer to its final resting place, the demolition yard. We've got 747 parked in the way, which has finished the teardown almost. We want to get it over to the pan. We can't move it because the wings are so big, so we need to chop the wings off. Once we cut the wings off, it's still going to be tight getting through the, the two buildings between the hangars over to the uh, disposal yard. They've also built a new gate between the hangars as part of the new uh, airport control. So um, I've measured it out. It looks like it'll fit within, with a, a foot or so to spare. So uh, should be easy, he says. It's easy to be confident when you're not the one behind the steering wheel. But it's fair to say that Sam clearly doesn't lack any confidence either. I what makes a dream come true, mate. If Sam isn't firing on all cylinders, his dream could quickly descend into a nightmare. He must shift the surrounding planes to safety before the 747's huge wings can be clipped off. Just got these two moved a bit. It's just so when they come to uh, chop this wing off, they're not in the way. So get them moved now rather than disturb the lads while when they start working. Get them back as far as we can now. It's a close call. Sam has had to hit the brakes hard to avoid potential disaster, as the wing of his plane is dangerously close to the parked-up aircraft. We've got a good foot more there, haven't we, at the moment? Yeah. 
So as long as we don't come underneath that, then it's a bit closer. We'll have a look. We'll get okay. something just short, and then we'll have another look, mate, yeah? Sam will need to rely on Dave's keen eye as he slowly inches the aircraft forward to safety. Dave, okay, we'll keep going. Go as far as we can. There's a nose here, OK? We'll go as far as we can. OK, but I've got my nose here. You've got a meter. When you're parking around here, especially when you're up around by the hangar, it can be really tight, because got, we've got so many aircraft dotted around. OK. The closer we got there, the bigger the gap looks. The gap might look big to Sam, but it's anything but. I think once you know the line you need to turn it and where you need to aim the main wheels to, then uh, it's all good. The 747 is now in a position to have its wings safely removed before continuing its journey into the scrapyard for its final crushing. Although this wrecking crew have destroyed countless wings before, it's always a risky business, fraught with danger. Just getting ready to, to uh, chop the wing off. So we're just putting a cord up now to try and keep everyone out. Thankfully, it's safety first for Sam, who's the man with the plan to ensure the jumbo can get cut to shreds and everyone else can come out in one piece. Dangers, so many. You're going to have bits of metal flying around, falling on someone's head. We're just trying to avoid the air as best as possible. Some will uh, not heed the cordon. Just think they're no better, and the Ken wants to go somewhere now already. You ain't done. Should I go back in the Um Yeah, we need to get a cordon up on the other side a bit, mate, yeah? So we need to find some more cones. Chicken may not have found any cones, but he's managed to mobilise a couple of manly marshals. What, I hear you ask, could possibly go wrong? Under Chicken's watchful eye, the powerful pincer starts its salvo. And after a barrage of blows, the tip of the right wing can take no more. It's not just the Jumbo's colossal 212-foot wingspan that poses a potential risk. Although the plane has been emptied of its fuel and oil, there's a real danger that a small amount remains. The fear is that a dangerous fire could engulf the plane. Might be a spark. Make sure we've got flames and that, so we're ready with the fire machine in case it is. It seems that Sam has picked up a tip or two from the earlier visit from the fire service. But, ever the optimist, he clearly believes that it's not the size of the hose, it's what you do with it that counts. The powerful mechanical jaws are relentless in their assault. He's flying through at the moment. He won't be long and, uh, and he'll be off. Last little bit now. Both wings have been clipped and the jumbo is on the ropes. But this fight is far from over yet. The 747 is showing its true class as a heavyweight, and it's clear that it's not going to go down without a fight. It just shows how violent it is, then we see the legs going up and down. You watch the nose leg as well. Doing that all the time. Crazy. Got the dancing, isn't it? More shearing is needed. But under the intense onslaught, it's becoming more and more unstable. You see the aircraft moving around like this. The best thing for this, when it's doing this, is put sleepers in. Don't stop it moving, but it stops it a little bit. We've got no brakes on the aircraft either. It's been removed. Without its full outstretched wings giving it balance, the fuselage is bucking like a Bronco. I'm going to be down there in a minute. I ain't staying there when that drops. It's too close. With the last piece of wing hanging by a thread, Sam retreats to a respectful distance. And luckily for him, he's a man with impeccable timing. It's a bit just landed right where I was stood. <laughs> yeah, job done, eh? The new clip wing 747. I tell you what, he's like a man on a mission. He shot like a good day last yeah, time. Yeah, he practice last time, didn't yeah. he? <laughs> oi, oi! Uh. The first skirmish may have been won, but the war is far from over. It's just time for the dust to settle before the next offensive can begin. Oh, 
The remains of this once mighty 747 are almost ready to be scrapped. But before this can happen, the boys are faced with having to manoeuvre it into the dismantling yard. So the plan today is to try and get this, the 747, into the yard. That all sounds straightforward enough. But some new gates were put in recently, and nothing as big as a jumbo has ever been manoeuvred through them. It's got hope now that the measurements that they took for the gates are big enough. What I'm going to do is try and turn it around here, so I'm going back end first. And as if even more pressure needs to be piled on Sam and the gang, there's been a problem with their tug. As you can see, we're in the old tug. We had um, a hose blow on ours this morning which is going to make things a little bit more difficult. Uh, I've lost the uh, four-wheel steering ability that we had. That's just what you need when you're having to shift the biggest plane in the yard. It's just the length of it, really. I mean, I can't, I can't see anything in the back end there now. I mean, bonuses, we've got no wings, so we ain't got to worry about that. So we'll see how it goes, see if we can turn it without uh, knocking any buildings over. <laughs> Any gateposts. I think not causing any carnage would be the preferred option, Sam. Luckily for Sam, he's not on his own. Bob and Hayden are also keeping a close eye on things. It's absolutely massive, and you don't have a concept of how big it is until you're right underneath it. The hardest bit is going to be this that's turning it at the right angle and knowing where to turn to get it through the gates. If I take that fence down, I'm going to be uh, Mr. Poplar, aren't I? <laughs> Due to the, uh, the massive size of what a jumbo is, big spaces get small real quick. So you've got to be kind of thinking two or three steps ahead of what you want to do and where you want to end up, because otherwise you can tie yourself in a knot pretty quickly. There's no room for error. It's clear that Sam just isn't going to make it. Basically, the turn is too tight for him because of the width of the tails. It's absolutely huge. So he's not going to get the nose round far enough before he clips 76 hanger. So he's going to have to try and take the nose that way to bring a shallower angle to get that gear as close to that as possible, but with the tail further on this side to try and make it run down the centre. Well, boys, you know the saying, if at first you don't succeed, That's virtually in line with that now. You've got about a foot off the wall on the tip of the yeah, foot. Stab. The foot's loads of room. Yeah, I know. We can these work got, with... Both of these are going to have to come off, aren't they? We can work with inches. Oh, they're going to have to go, yeah. yeah. Let's get chicken over there, cut them off now. The plane is now dangerously close to the hangar wall on its left and also the fence to its right. Hello. We need some cutting assistance over there, mate. Come out and have a look and uh, sort it out. Cheers. We just going to see Chicken now. We've got, we got to get his doors off. Even if the, the wheelbase is spot on, then doors come out another foot or more. Sam's call has been answered as Chicken arrives to check out the problem, and he's brought Perry and some power tools with him. As soon as they put the gate there, I still knew there'd be problems. Just leave it like that. All right, cool. Cheers, mate. Just a minor trim, nothing special. Hopefully, it'll make it a little bit easier for Sam then. It's hoped the jumbo can slip through the tight opening. And it's over to Master Tugger Sam to pull it off. Sam's a professional tugger. He loves it. <laughs> It's, it takes over most of his day sometimes. It takes a lot of practice to get good at it, and it's very easy. You can get yourself in a mess. It appears that Sam has hit another problem. Well, almost. Ah, uh, sake. I don't know what to do. If he goes back, Bob, and swings the tail in and then brings it back, he should clear it, yeah. shouldn't he? Whatever the lads try, it looks like the 747 is just too jumbo to fit. Right, we'll have to go back down there again. Do the same again. I'm going to pull it over more, and then we'll go for it. Yeah. Oh, it should go. We'll get there. We're, we're near. We're better than we were. Yeah. 
It seems an impossible task, but Sam and the crew are refusing to give up. It's a trust thing, you know. He, he's got to know that I'll drag him through a space that is a, you know, really small if I can do, but at the same time without taking any undue risks. Take it away, Jack. Look at that, like a club. Can't fault there. It's just a matter of getting it lined up right. There's plenty of room. There's loads of room on that side as well now, but it's just getting that angles and everything else. It's all that clever stuff that I don't know how to do. There are just centimetres to spare. be through, but he can't lose concentration just yet. Calling the whole affair a tight fit is putting it mildly. You got 20 foot. <laughs> I think we did that on plan A. Not too bad. At least we didn't get to plan Z. Big smile. <coughs> How do? Now we've got this one through. Uh, hopefully, I know where I've got to aim things at, and I should. Uh, it shouldn't be so bad. Uh, I'd like to say it's his final resting place. I ain't going to move it no more. It's going to stay there. It's going to go up on a couple of towers and uh, have its undercarriage removed, and then it's uh, into baked bean tins. My plan now is we're going to go back through that gate, lock it, and then go for a not well-earned brew. Against the odds, Sam and his team have finally managed to put the 747 in its place, ready for the grand finale, the ultimate teardown. The day of destruction has dawned for the 747. The lads have now stripped the Jumbo's last remaining valuable part, her landing gear. Roughly 100 tonnes of non-reusable fuselage now remain. And once it's been pulverized, scrap metal companies will bid to take these remnants away and turn them into other manufacturing goods. It's been an epic journey shifting what's left of this colossal craft into the yard. So it's no surprise that the lads now can't wait to see the back of it. Well, today is uh, one of the days I've been looking forward to to get this uh, absolute beast off my yard. It takes up the majority of it. It's been just a pain, and hopefully uh, within the hour, the demolition team will be up onto it and uh, we'll be taking it down. They're going to remove the tail section and then just dig in from the rear uh, to the centre section with the centre wing tanks and, and the wing roots, and then hopefully it'll collapse under its own weight. The extraordinary size of the jumbo doubtless means that this won't be just an ordinary day at the office for Chicken and the lads as there could still be a sting in its mighty tail. Not only is it a lot larger compared to the smaller ones that we use, but it's just everything is stronger and bigger, um, structural. The areas where they bolt on the landing gear and the centre wing tanks are going to be very tough. Safety of planes and personnel is the number one priority in the scrapyard. With the 747 towering so tall, Chicken is concerned that debris could fall dangerously close to his pride and joy, his new fence. We've got the uh, horizontal stabilizers and the uh, left hand one. It's close to the fence line, and I get in trouble when the fence gets broken. Despite the lad's vast experience, it's a job that's fraught with hazards. So Andy and the digger is briefed to ensure his safety. I think the other side is quite close to the fence. The smaller the bit of tail you take off, the better. I don't want it to fall back and, and hit the landing gears we've removed either. The 747's landing gear is also kept close to the body of the plane, too close for Chicken's liking. And Chicken is not the only one happy to see the troublesome 747 smash to smithereens. We'll have to see the back of this proper, dirty, filthy, large, huge, just too big it is. With chicken safety briefing over, Andy can carefully crack on with the task at hand. Just trimming the tail down, making it more of a, a manageable size. Trim axe right. Every time he's hitting it, it's moving up and down. as big as the 
wing on the women. Yeah, so like seven three, 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 Andy has to concentrate on demolishing bits of 747 on the ground, whilst Chicken is trying to find some helping hands, and a hand is all he could find, as a replacement forklift can't be found at such short notice. With the landing gear safely out of harm's way, Andy can return to smashing the mighty tail off the 747. Take long to come off. I think it's a bottom boat, it should just fall on its own. To bring the tail down as safely as possible, the lads have carefully planned that Andy pulls it off the fuselage and into the yard. A bit noisy. Yeah, it's gonna be uh, it's pretty horrific, I think. <laughs> I don't think it's gonna be very graceful. The tail is uh, starting to move on its own uh, away from the fuselage, so I think. Probably now just the floor. Uh, he cuts through that floor and it'll go. The it's rocking, it's going to twist off, mate. Like, to the side. I think mean, he's going to pull it towards us. You can't predict what's going to happen, can you? No. I don't think it'll be long before it comes off for the amount of weight. There it goes. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I think we need to see that again. Ooh. We'll get some more pants for the driver now. <laughs> the daylight went out there for the camping there, didn't it? <laughs> Andy is safe and sound. And so too, thankfully, is Chicken's pride and joy, his fence. Happy days. Fences are OK. We went the right way, the main thing, isn't it? Yeah, job well done. Andy! Yeah! That was close. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad. <laughs> close, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah it come off nice, though, didn't it? Yeah, lucky. Yeah, it was coming close to you, though. Did you know twitch there? Yeah, well, you didn't know. <laughs> I didn't want it going the other way and hit the fan. Yeah, man, yeah, you did well. On it. Yeah, it was a uh, good job. And it stayed well within the yard, so uh, happy days. Nice one. Down now, isn't it? They come down quite, quite calmly, really, isn't it? Yeah. No big bang. After confirming it's safe to continue, Andy and the digger is happy to get back to bringing down the remaining mass of metal and material. And there's still plenty to sink his teeth into. It's going to get harder for him. He's just about to hit the uh, centre wing tank. Once he gets through that, it'll break its back, and it should be the easiest bit then. Forward, the uh, forward freights and the, and the flight deck, it should be uh, should be relatively easy once he gets through this harder centre section. The epic battle to reduce the remnants of the colossal 747 to small pieces of scrap is entering its final stages. It's had a face lift, uh, not much left of him now. See the way he takes the doors off, just grabs them and rips them off. <laughs> About to snap the wing off. It's like something out of Jurassic Park. It's a mechanical dinosaur chewing through his prey. It's brilliant. And mercilessly chew it does. The T-Rex sized jaws tossing aside the ripped out chunks of this remarkable plane. That's gonna come crashing down any minute now. And there we have it. <laughs> For the wrecking crew, the 747 was a formidable opponent, but there was only ever going to be one winner. As far as the demolition has gone on a whole, it's gone really well, really happy. Happy days, nice for me.
This once colossus of the skies may now look a sorry sight of scrap metal. But it's worth remembering that in a way she will live to fly another day. At least her parts will. In a variety of other jumbos that are still in service across the world. So it's a happy ending after all.